各位來賓，歡迎曬大家嚟到多倫多皮爾遜國際機場，我係劉卓輝，好高興咧今晚擔任大會嘅主持。Your participation tonight is very, very important because it's not only provide us an opportunity to thank you in person for your generous support of all these work in China and also throughout the developing world. But it's also giving you an opportunity to learn more about the world's only fully equipped state-of-the-art eye surgery and teaching facility host inside this DC-10 aircraft, the Alves Flying Eye Hospital. Well, I would say we're the luckiest group in, of people in Canada because Toronto is actually the first stop of this goodwill visit. And then the hospital will be gone to China to implement site saving programs later this fall. 今晚咧可以話誒，你哋嘅參與咧係非常非常之重要噶。誒，能夠因為咧可以能夠俾到我哋啊一個機會去親自多謝你哋，去支持呢一個奧比斯中國農村護眼計劃。咁除此之外咧，亦都可以話調翻轉啦，俾到你哋一個機會咧，去認識多啲呢一架設備完善、科技先進。而且咧，誒呢一架嘅誒奧比斯嘅飛機醫院啦，咁而且咧仲可以有機會咧同一啲嘅醫護人員同埋職員咧瞭解更多更多關於奧比斯喺全球嘅眼疾醫療預防同埋一啲嘅培訓工作嘅。關注咧。I travel with the plane seven to eight months of the year. So there are 23 of us from 10 different countries. We're a multicultural group. And uh, you'll meet some more of our staff on the rest of the tour. What happens in here um, are laser operations, which are performed with these two uh, machines here. They treat diseases such as glaucoma. Behind you, just on this side, we have slip maps, which I'm sure if you've all had your eyes checked, they're the machines that you would have used. This here is called a surgical, surgical simulator. And this is what we're using. Um, it's a super duper computer, basically, to uh, provide a virtual world within an eye. These two instruments on either side are inserted in. And you look through the eyepiece. And what that does is it provides students with an opportunity to cut, to tear, to pull, to chop, and practice all their skills before they start on real people. It's proven to be really successful. There are only 10 in the world, and we are lucky because we have one of them. So I'd like to take you on. We prepare the patient. We pull the monitors. We have three monitors here. We have also three tables. And then before they go to the operating room, if they have local anesthesia, we put already the anesthesia here in the recovery. While the general anesthesia, we do it inside the operating room, especially for the kids. Uh, the local anesthesia, they spend time 30 minutes here, while the general anesthesia, they stay uh, two hours to two hours and a half. It depends the recovery of the kids, so we can send back to the hospital. Also here we have uh, two nurses, local nurses, that we train them with the monitors, with the patient, especially the patient education. After the surgery, that the patient come back here when they are uh, local anesthesia or even the general, we instruct already the relatives or the parents of the patient or the patient's child just to care, take care of themselves when they go back in their own uh, house and everything. Okay, uh, as you can see, we have lots of dolls here. Uh, we have also a pediatric wig. So when the kids, uh, especially on the screening, we already we already give them some dust during the screen selection of the patient until they arrive here so that they can divert their attention with this dust so that they can they won't think their surgery so before the surgery we just do everything just to forget and then the next door here is the substarian area this is the area that we clean all our uh, dirty instruments we pack them and we sterilize them. And most of the cabinets are, are stuck, cabinet, cabinet. And that's it in the recovery. Do you have any questions? Uh, year round, and uh, we find ourselves in the operating room. 
As you can see, everything on this plane is designed to give the highest level of eye care possible throughout the world. But it's also designed to give the highest level of teaching anywhere in the world. Within this room, we have eight cameras, not including the ones that have been brought in by you guys. <laughs> we also have a camera built into the microscope and a unique microscope that has two headsets so that the training doctor and the teaching doctor can constantly be watching each other throughout the process. I tell everyone that our job is to come into a country and show how, not to show off. And our goal is to teach as much as humanly possible during those three-week programs. What I tell everyone is I'm probably the only doctor in the world that is working this hard to put himself out of business. My job is to make my job no longer necessary. And that's one of the most rewarding things of Orbis is at the end of the program having the training doctor say, hey, Dr. Hunter, you don't need to, to watch me. I can do it myself. That, that really is what I, what I enjoy is seeing something carried on and the legacy that you get to leave. And, and that's probably the, the, the real best part of Orbis and being an educator. Well, I know everything about this plane, uh, except how to fly it. <laughs> and we, we look at every single penny we spend. Yeah. And again, you're, you're very wise. I don't know if you're in economics. Obviously, it does not, it, it's not cost effective if you look at the number of patients treated during a program. You know, there are other more effective ways to do that from a cost standpoint. But training doctors, bringing all this equipment in, training nurses and biomedical engineers, that is what really makes the plane cost effective. Again. You know, if you said, okay, Dr. Hunter, how many cataract surgeries could you do in a day? I could come in in two weeks and maybe do 300, okay? But once I leave, no other cataract surgeries are going to be done. Whereas if I train someone and at the end of those weeks, they're doing 10 cataract surgeries a week and they keep operating for 20 years, that is more cost effective because you look at how much you've improved the healthcare system. Also, one of the things I always tell people, for example, uh, the plane is very good at getting the attention and awareness of the public and the politicians. As you know, politicians make public policy in regards to uh, public health. But if you looked at it from a cost analysis standpoint of how many patients do you treat on a plane per week, it's not necessarily the most cost effective. But if you're looking at the best way to enhance a medical system, to improve the conditions where the doctors work, and to train doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, and biomedical engineers, I think the cost is more than justified. That doctors are only people, of course we take all the credit, but really we're only as good as the equipment we have and the personnel that's helping us deliver healthcare. And so that's why I always want to emphasize that we're not just training doctors, we're also training the nurses, anesthesiologists, so we really are training you know, several hundred people at maximal programs. Other programs it may be 60 doctors, but again, even if those 60 doctors you know, go on and, and help 10 additional people a month, you're looking at 600 people that you're helping over a 12-month 12 12 period, that's 720 surgeries you just improved or made possible. So it, it does become a feed-forward system where, you know, almost like the butterfly effect, where a butterfly flapping its wings in Beijing could cause a hurricane a year later, that's what meteorologists have speculated. And really, you never know how, what a small little improvement can do 20 years and how many other people that person you taught goes on to teach. If, you know, for example, Dr. Leonard uh, trained the uh, first vitreoretinal surgeon in Jordan, the country of Jordan. Well, he has now gone on to become probably the preeminent uh, vitreoretinal surgeon in that country and has trained who knows how many dozens of doctors afterwards. So really that's the beauty of education, is it's not, it's not perishable, it's sustainable and it only amplifies with time. Well, I think we planned out what we were going to do during those two weeks. So, like I said, you're right. I think establishing good relationships and using each other's strengths to build a better future I think is wonderful. Hunter, perhaps you could describe how self-contained the airplane is as a hospital. Right, that, that's, a, that's a great question. No matter where we go, we're able to deliver the same health care. And, for example, this plane truly is an engineering masterpiece. Not only do you have vibration dampening floors and all these amazing equipment, but within this plane you have a self-sufficient electrical source, a self-sufficient water source, and a self-sufficient air purification source. So no matter where we go, we can literally pull water out of a pond, run it through our uh, filtration system, and it's literally cleaner than any water you're going to find throughout the world. It's higher standards than those used in North America or Europe. So no matter where we go, we are truly self-sufficient. The only thing we ask of the country is they provide us with an airstrip to land the plane and a medical community that wants to learn. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As a chair of Cycling China, 
along with committee advisor John Yun, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the August Flying Eye Hospital first historic visit to Toronto. And many thanks to Office Canada for giving our Chinese Canadian community opportunity to help those who critically need the help in the poor rural region of China. Ladies and gentlemen, we can look, we can all look around and see this beautiful world, the blue sky, the white clouds, the green trees, and most important of all, the smiling face from our children and our beloved ones. Please, be with me to close your eyes for 20 seconds now. What did you see? A help of darkness, an emptiness of nothing, <laughs> and a loss of dignity, hope, and independence. Approximately 9 million people are crying in China, but 75% of them can be preventable or curable. That means 6.7 million Chinese, they are, do not have to be blind. But thanks to your generosity, we are empowering others to continue the strengthening things. I scared in the China project, helping to restore their eyesight to those poor blind patients in China, giving them back dignity, hope, independence, and above all, is love. Tonight's event is the first step in the right direction. But in only the first step. Our goal is to raise $150,000 by the end of this year. So please continue to spread our message around and please continue to give generously. On behalf of the many millions of poor blind patients in China, thank you. And I want to say a few words in Cantonese. 在這個馬國國記者會度講過 
Honourable Vivian Poi。我哋而家請熱烈嘅掌聲，有請我哋嘅尊敬嘅第一位加拿大參議員，有請。Dr. Leonard, staff of Orbis Flying Eye Hospital, doctors, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. 各位朋友，大家好。Thank you for inviting me to Orbis Canada's Flying Eye Hospital Canada Goodwill visit. I will. I wish to extend a very warm welcome on the occasion. Of the Flying Eye Hospital's historic visit to Toronto, it is a very new experience for my staff, my husband, and me to be at this event, sights on China at the GTA Airport hangar, and to welcome the Flying Eye Hospital crew here today. This event is a rare opportunity for donors and supporters of Orbis to get a first-hand look. At the Orbis plane, and to learn more about Orbis directly from the seasoned medical volunteers and flight crew, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of all those whose sight has been saved by Orbis worldwide to thank Dr. David Patton for his vision in extending prevention and treatment to populations in developing countries. Who have no access to ophthalmologic care that we, in developed countries, take for granted. His vision at the beginning of the 1970s has become the Orbis Flying Eye Hospital that exists today. I believe Dr. Leonard mentioned you have so far treated 22 million patients worldwide, and that's very impressive. Orbis Canada has 22 doctors, eight nurses, and three medical technicians participating in Orbis programs. Worldwide, there are over 400 volunteer medical professionals participating, and I'm glad to learn that Canada stands third behind the U.S. and the U.K. in its contributions. Since 1982, Orbis has carried out more than 600 sight-saving. Programs in over 80 countries, and has helped to train more than 124,000 doctors and other eye care professionals. Endorsed by 70 heads of state, the World Health Organization, and by three successive Secretaries General of the United Nations, Orbis has been praised as a diplomatic ambassador, promoting. Cooperation between nations and an effective organization in the fight against global blindness. Because of Canada's strong links to China, particularly through more than a million Canadians of Chinese heritage who make this country their home, and 250,000 Canadians, in fact, probably more than that, making China theirs. Orbis is giving Chinese Canadians the chance to give back to their country of origin. Since 2001, 14 Canadian medical professionals—doctors, nurses, biomedical technicians, and photographers—have participated in the programs in China. In this special event today, Sites on China, Orbis' work is an important part of bridge building between China and Canada. The project will strengthen the capacity of existing blindness programs through Orbis various training platforms. The Orbis Blind Eye Hospital, Hospital Telemedicine Fellowships, and hospital-based programs, which enables volunteer medical professionals from Canada and other developed countries to provide mentoring, case-by-case -case consultation. And online educational material to ophthalmologists from developing countries, including China. As Canadians, we know that we're very fortunate to have access to quality eye care when we need it, and we take this for granted. In rural areas in China, 
accessible and affordable eye care services are virtually non-existent. Most of China's eye care professionals live in urban centers, while 80% of the country's blind live in the rural areas. Resources are sadly lacking. The unfortunate reality is that much of the blindness that does occur is avoidable. If simple eye care treatments were available, there are approximately, as mentioned earlier, 9 million people in China who are blind. More than 6.7 million don't have to be. Blindness is debilitating and costly, both on a personal and economic level, causing great losses to families and communities who suffer as a result. Worldwide, the economic impact of blindness and low vision is even greater at 42 billion US dollars. This is why Orbis's work is so essential. We must fight back against this terrible scourge. As a country rich in cultural diversity, Canadians tend to support international development efforts. Just look at the outpouring of support after the tsunami. I believe Canadians understand their responsibility as global citizens and are making a real difference. Without reservation, I endorse the important work that Orbis Canada is doing in China through strengthening eye care and rural China project. I applaud the efforts of those here this evening who have taken a leadership role in supporting Orbis Canada's Strengthening Eye Care in Rural China project and encourage Canadians to give generously to this important initiative. I also encourage Canadians of Chinese heritage to honor their roots by supporting the healthcare development of China and to particip participate in Morbus Sight Saving Mission. It is a simple way that you can impact the lives of so many in a meaningful way. And thank you very much. Families and tragedy that is needless and through your cooperation will stop this tragedy. I want to introduce them. Mr. Allen, Mr. Peter Allen is a treasurer of Arbus Canada Board of Directors. He is a treasurer of Arbus Canada Board of Directors. He is a treasurer of Arbus Canada Board of Directors.